Welcome back for our seventh and final interview. This is Nicole Naditz, your host for this series of interviews that bring to life the high leverage teaching practices for world language educators. I want to thank the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for their stewardship of this project, which includes not only these interviews, but two webinars and a series of short TED-Ed lessons. Our final high leverage teaching practice emphasizes successful strategies for providing oral corrective feedback to improve learner performance. This practice requires an understanding of productive versus unproductive approaches to feedback. Teachers become adept at providing learners with meaningful, actionable feedback that learners both understand in terms of what it means regarding the performance for which the feedback was intended and what it means for their future communication efforts. Our guest for this high leverage teaching practice is Christine Lanfear. Christine is a French teacher at Natomas High School near Sacramento, California. She is extremely active in the world language community, serving on the board of the Foreign Language Association of Greater Sacramento and as the co-director of the Capital World Language Project. Christine served as the co-chair of the Standards Advisory Committee facilitating the work of a diverse group of world language professionals as they informed the writing of California's new world languages content standards. Due to her outstanding facilitation of that work and extensive credentials in world language pedagogy, she was asked to be the lead writer for the forthcoming California World Languages Framework. Christine was the 2007 ATFL National Language Teacher of the Year and has received many additional honors for her powerful work in world language education. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Um, we're going to jump right into these questions. So to start, we all know that many teachers and even students seek an error-free performance when speaking in the target language. In your experience, what role do errors play in acquisition? And what are the risks you associate with emphasizing an error-free performance? Well, I, I always try to emphasize to my students that making errors is actually one of the fundamental ways that you develop your language proficiency. In fact, as, as young speakers of our L1, whatever that L1 is, we are constantly making errors and through corrective feedback from our parents, usually in the form of modeling, we eventually develop and, and change our practice so that we actually make the uh, communication as error-free as possible. However, I also try to ask them to think about their own practice right now. And I work with high school students as, as probably most of our um, viewing public does, and they're pretty adept at communicative tasks. And I asked them, are you perfect when you speak whatever your native language is? And they have to think about it, and then they almost always do admit that no, they make errors all the time. And I said, so do I. So do my friends. When I'm chatting with my friends, I stop and restart all the time. And so this is a normal practice in communication and it should not be viewed on as a bad thing. The other thing is that I want the students to understand that you learn from those mistakes because eventually it goes into your brain as you start seeing patterns form, you realize wait a minute, I said it that way before, but now my teacher's saying it differently. What has changed? Or um, I, I said it that way before, and now I'm saying it, oh, I caught myself. Okay, let me fix that and move forward. So it's a way that we develop the proficiency in languages. Um, and there is no, it, the other thing is I want the students in their head to hear, hear, when it's right or wrong. And oftentimes they'll ask me, how do I say that? And, or if they have to pick between two options, I'll ask them to say it in their head quietly to themselves, which one sounds right? And almost always they can identify the one that is correct. Um, so it's, it, it, this is a key to developing the self-correction mechanism that we need our students to be able to do as they function with language. 
And I think it's really, really a bad idea to emphasize error-free performance, especially when we're working with adolescents, because adolescents are so keen on, I've got to be perfect. I don't want to look like I'm doing it wrong. I don't want to look like I am, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And so a lot of our students come in even into level one, realizing that they don't know anything, but panicked about the fact that they don't know anything. And, and it's natural that they don't know much at that point. They're novice low. Um, so we want to make sure that we're setting up an environment in our classrooms where it is not bad to make an error, it is good to make an error. That we celebrate the attempt to communicate, even if you're not absolutely certain that it's going to be 100% correct, but we want you to express your ideas. Absolutely. Um, and so as these students make errors, there are a lot of ways that teachers can provide feedback, but they all kind of fall basically into two categories, either being implicit feedback or explicit feedback. So what would you say are the differences between these two types of corrective feedback and how do they interact to support learner proficiency? It's, it is a sliding scale. Uh, it's a continuum, if you want to think of it that way. And actually, in the um, in the high leverage teaching practices book, uh, they do a really nice job of, of of creating some some tables and models that make it real uh, tangible for you. Because it is hard to differentiate between these different types of feedback. But basically, bottom line, explicit feedback, as the word explicit would indicate means calling direct attention to the error in some form or another. Usually that's a, an opportunity to provide instruction on how to fix the error. Uh, and it might take the form of restating what the student said and then pausing before the error to kind of prompt the student to realize that's the word I want you to focus on, change it hint, hint, hint. Um, but of course, that's kind of a, uh, a, a, that's very teacher classroom. It's not going to happen as much in the real world. Um, and that form, that form of corrective feedback would be called elicitation. Um, or you might even outright tell the student that they must change the way they say something, which is an explicit correction. That I find is more effective one-on-one -on -one with a student. If you're doing some sort of a tutorial and you realize that they're making the same error over and over again, you say, hold the phone, stop, stop, stop. Let's talk about this. Here's how you fix it. Let's, now let's practice. Um, those are more direct. They are faster ways to give corrective feedback, but they also tend to be uh, viewed as criticism and so you need to bear in mind whether the student is ready to take criticism or might be extra sensitive to that. So that's explicit feedback. Implicit feedback is more subtle and kind of as a, as a result it is a little harder for the students to pick up on. It's a little trickier for teachers to to craft as well. However, there are a number of ways to be subtle with your corrective feedback. Um, and it tends to be the way I prefer to do it because I find it to be more nurturing as opposed to you're wrong. Uh, and I want to avoid that as much as possible, okay? Uh, so for example, you might restate the communication, whatever the student said, but rephrase it correctly. And the implicit or the hope, the implicit hope is that the student's going to pick up on the fact that that was different from what they said and why was it different and hope that they trust that the teacher might actually know what they're doing and take, oh, maybe that's the way to say it. Let me try it that way next time. Um, it also, it also involves uh, requiring the, uh, the learner to understand and notice that a correction was made. So it's more likely to be more effective a little later in the lesson sequence, as opposed to the very first time you do it. It, it. That's not to say don't do it the very first time you practice, but realize that they're not as likely to pick up on the error message that was sent subtly via thought waves and vibes, okay? Um, 
so basically you've got that ex explicit, implicit, and you've got things in between that transition from one to the other. You need to choose the one that feels comfortable for you and that works best for your students. Yeah, it really sounds like another key to this is really knowing your students because Absolutely. you hit on it earlier with the explicit feedback where, you know, which students, if you were to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, would be receptive to that. Mm -hmm. And that's also true in the implicit, knowing your students well enough to know, hey, are, are some of them actually going to pick up on the subtle mm -hmm. that I'm trying to provide? So that knowledge of students is another factor in Absolutely. This. Absolutely. So in addition to that, what additional factors do you recommend that teachers consider when determining how or even if they should provide corrective feedback when a learner makes a mistake? I'm glad that you said how and if, because in some cases, you know what, I don't care. I, I don't care at that point because we're doing something else. And there's a really great table in a yes, no table. I, I love those ones where it says, is, are you talking to the prince? Yes then say the formal. Are you talking to a kid? No, or and do another thing. There's a great table in that chapter that you should look at if you haven't looked at it. First of all, you gotta determine what's the focus of your communicative task at that time. And of course, we are doing simulations in our classroom. We're not doing real world out in the cafe talking for the most part. So we're, we're focusing our attention on a certain type of communication. What do we want to do here? Am I trying to encourage risk taking uh, and the attempt to communicate? Or am I polishing a language skill, a particular language skill and structure? And so do I want to make error correction if I want to really encourage risk taking? Probably not. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is, is that error impeding the, correct, the communication? Uh, a lot of times rubrics are phrased in the terms of errors do not interfere with communication or errors interfere with communication. And so we need to decide is, am I still able to understand that student? And ultimately, if they were out in the real world, um, for example, they were in a deli trying to order some lunch and they said sandwich, would they get a sandwich? Yeah. Did they give me a full sentence or did they tell me un sandwich and it's really un sandwich? It doesn't matter. They got their sandwich, they're not hungry. That's the important point. So is it impeding communication and are they able to relay their communication despite the error? Um, fine, uh, third, what's the lesson focus for that day and for that practice task? Is it the time to focus on the language structure or is the goal to produce a message and structure takes a lesser role or a secondary role? And finally, what is that socio-emotional socio uh, environment that you're working in in that class? And that is going to change class to class. I have one class of French ones, I have three altogether. I have one class of French ones who are very, very cerebral. They're really into, they want to focus on the structure. I have another one that are so social that I can't get anything done and they really don't care about error correction. So I have to, I have to morph to fit the people in the room. And I also need to be aware of the students that are going to shut down if they perceive that they're being criticized and not shut them down, but provide the more subtle forms of correction. More subtle forms or yeah, and forms that provide the models. Exactly. Um, and so on, absolutely. And what about their peers? What role can classmates play in supporting each other towards greater proficiency, including more accurate production? So this steps away from me as the controlling factor in the process of corrective feedback. And as a result, it also brings a little more complexity to, the fa to what's going on. And again, you have to read your students, you have to know your students, their maturity level. Um, a lot is going to have to do with age. Um, and of course, you know, dy dynamics in the room. Are there people that just absolutely do not get along? In which case, that's probably not the time to try peer feedback. Um, <laughs> however, uh, you can involve students in the peer feedback. It involves training. Train, not necessarily training for you, although that 
it can't be a bad thing, but training the students in what you want them to do and setting down very, very clear expectations for what they are going to do. For example, and I have to admit, I'm not necessarily very good at doing this. I just know that this would be the way to do it. Uh, but for example, uh, you have to plan that learning event very carefully in order to make sure that there is a component of a, a structure correction that's going to happen, that the, that the interaction is not simply a, a, a conversation. Is there something you want them to be working on? Okay. So it's important to train them in how to provide feedback, including providing sentence frames for that feedback. What does it look like when you give someone feedback? And that might involve building in some compliments. I like what you said, but do you think you could say X another way? Okay. And so they lead with a compliment and it doesn't make it quite so harsh, uh, especially adolescents and maybe, maybe just this time of year. I don't know what this week is bringing, but, uh, but they are just on each other's cases at some times in the year. And so you want to be able to make sure that you've set the tone for the corrective feedback. Okay. Uh, one, one way that you could engage them in providing feedback is doing some sort of a grouping and having roles. Uh, and this is obviously a lot of different ways to group for roles. Uh, for example, you could have someone as a timer, someone as a recorder, someone as a facilitator, and someone as a feedback provider. And that person is equipped with the sentence frames, and that person is instructed, you're listening for this thing in particular and it's the thing you the structure that the teacher wants to work on and polish and so then in the course of doing the group activity you rotate through the roles so everybody has a chance to do each of the roles uh, not just one not just the best student is the feedback provider and then everyone else feels attacked um, but you know everybody has a responsibility to provide some feedback in the process yeah, I think when um, I've tried to do this, I came kind of to the same understanding that my students had to really know and understand exactly what they were going to be looking for. And if they have different roles, what each of them is looking for and how they were going to communicate what they found. Mm -hmm. So I think another piece that can sometimes be helpful is even doing what we as adult teachers do sometimes in some circles, which would be norming, you know, giving them opportunities to practice yeah. giving feedback on a safe task that everybody feels pretty confident that they did, you know, they, they, it was something even from last year, something that now they've really solidified their knowledge in so that they can practice giving feedback in those ways. No, and that's, and that's an incredibly good point. Um, the practice of, of how do you do it on a safe topic and the other thing that I might add as another layer of accountability would be to provide some sort of a, a, a note taking grid that everybody is recording what they're doing when they do that role. And that the feedback provider needs to record that they gave X number of pieces of feedback, you know, and what feedback they gave. And then the timekeeper is noting when did they start, when did they stop, so that they, they have a thing they're going to turn in it also helps the teacher reflect on it looked like it was going okay but did it really it, were they able to produce something that demonstrated that they went through this process uh, what are the ramifications of providing too much assistance or too much feedback um, well it's almost the same as if you uh, if you are like make enforcing the fact that no it's wrong no it's wrong it can shut everything down and cause students to not be willing to take risks um because if a teacher immediately corrects everything that is wrong um they don't want to go on i mean who would i wouldn't uh so it's uh it's more of a case of and for example if i even if i have a student who's reading something aloud that's in English in a French one class and they get to a word that they don't know and they get stumped and they go, how do you say that? And I said, well, how would you sound that? I'm not giving them the answer right away. I'm asking them to stretch a little bit. And then if they need a model, I can give them a model and so on. So you don't want to immediately correct all the time. 
Uh, it also gives you a reputation of being that mean correcting teacher. And uh, number two, too much of that corrective assistance may lead to them just simply waiting for you to give them the answer. And that's a little bit akin to if you're working with target language and then immediately translating, they're just gonna wait for the English because they see the pattern of events. You want to be very consistent. You wanna be consistent with your corrective feedback. You wanna be selective in your corrective feedback as well. And if you use a judicious amount of feedback, in a variety of formulas, because no, don't worry, don't forget that no one instructional strategy works for everything, but no one corrective feedback works for everything. I know I have my preferences, and I've already hinted or even stated that my preference is to go for that nurturing modeling kind of a corrective feedback, but I try lots of different forms. And I ask for student input if, we, if we're sharing up on the board to, see if we've got it right, I'm asking them, tell me, is it right? You know, because I want them to really hone in on analyzing for the pieces, the little pieces, because we're really focusing on that. Um, and so if we get used to the concept of making errors and that it's okay, that's how we develop, that's how students develop the ability to self-correct, circumlocute, which is a super important ability in, especially in a, a world when you're speaking another language that you're not as familiar with. And also to use other communicative tools, whether it's, whether it's uh, facial expression or body movements and so on to get your point across. Absolutely. So what are some of the key skills that teachers should develop in order to maximize the benefits of corrective feedback? So when I was considering that question, um, it, had, it brought to mind, it really is a lot about teachers developing their own comfort zone and understanding all of these factors that we've been talking about, the environment, the, the attitude of the students and so on and so forth, but primarily your own comfort with giving corrective feedback. First of all, you gotta develop patience. Errors are going to happen, and those errors are something you should celebrate as well as the students. And your students are going to make mistakes. That is completely normal language development. It is not normal if they come in perfect in level one first day, because then they're in the wrong class. They should be somewhere else. Um, so you need to develop patience as well as helping the students develop patience. Um, you also need to be able to split your attention, and to a certain extent that's true for all of teaching. You have to split part of your brain into the communicating with the students, if it's a question and answer. And then the other side into the analyzing, did they do it right, and do I want to at this time try to make some corrective feedback, or am I going to wait and see what happens down the line? Um, so you've got to make some split set second decisions and that takes practice. Um, one of the suggestions in the, in the chapter is, okay, now consider these scenarios. What would you do? Which piece would you pick? Wh where would you go with it? And I, I think that's a really valuable, at least thinking tool. Uh, and then try it out on your own students in the classroom. And finally, you've got to, you've got to develop positivity. Um, you've got to always smile, even when you're giving corrective feedback, okay? Because your, your smile is, uh, and your, your enthusiasm, yay, you, you said it, is their encouragement to try again in the future. And if you're, if you're coming at it from a frowny face and, oh, why don't they get it, and so on and so forth, then it then it starts to to dampen the mood yeah and there's so much research to support that if students feel cared for mm -hmm. um, they will actually rise to almost any level of expectation if they know that the teacher who's bringing them to that point really cares for them and encourages them and values them mm -hmm. um, traditionally Corrective feedback has been a sort of a one-way exchange between the teacher and student. 
So what are the benefits of enlisting the student's own participation in the feedback process? So again, this is a little more challenging than the standard uh, back and forth and I'm going to model and so on. And you need to pick the times that you can make this work. And sometimes this might be the tutorial one-on-one -on -one, uh, engagement, but it can work in the whole class setting as well. Um, so for example, if you can use the, the technique of clarification, which is a really a conversation with the student, then you're actually continuing the conversation down the line. It's not stopping for error correction and then now let's pick it back up. So for example, um, the, the actual act of providing feedback is the conversation that goes forward. Um, it mirrors real world conversation that we would do to negotiate meaning in any interpersonal uh, technique. And this week in particular, I'm very cognizant of this because I've got ringing in one of my ears, which is a very annoying. And, and I have students in first period who speak with the volume of a very small mouse. And, and I'm asking them and I see their lips moving and I can't hear anything they're saying. And I finally had to stop and say, guys, I can't hear you. And if I go like this, what, what did you say? It's not the, and then they'll go, oh, never mind. No, no, I just really can't hear you. <laughs> and so that's something that you're automatically going to do in a regular situation. You're in a loud restaurant. What was that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. But you can also, um, you can also in a more formal educational setting, uh, engage in the metalinguistic conversation, especially in a one-on-one -on -one tutorial type setting with students who you feel are at the point, and these, maybe some of your older students with more sophisticated language structures that they're working with, you can help them really embed and, and scaffold those structures by talking about why it works that way and why it didn't work the way they did it. And you can do that by offering options. You can do that by you know, asking them to explain why they picked that word over another word and so on. Yeah, I mean, as we've gone through this conversation, it becomes more and more clear that for our teachers, this is going to be them on a continuum of practice as well, because the fallback models of giving correction to students, whether, you know, especially on paper, but also orally, they aren't, they are easier. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't necessarily, however, align to what research tells us will actually result in better outcomes for students. So we have to give ourselves permission to learn this new process, try to implement it a little bit, and grow from each implementation. What strategies do you recommend, therefore, in order to transition from a one-way feedback model to a more dialogic one? It, this definitely is, is going to be for the teacher, the sort of the development of the master practice. Um, and I'm not necessarily certain I do it as well as I could do it. Uh, part of that is that I don't, I don't have the opportunity to do it as much. And one of the things you just said triggered for me, we have to be realistic. We're most of the time in a classroom in front of 30 plus students and trying to do at least one communication per day with each of them and get them to produce something for us. And we've got to go fast, fast, fast. We can't necessarily, and, and maybe they're also at a linguistic proficiency level where they can't engage in things like metalinguistics. Um, and, and so we, we have to pick and choose, obviously. But I think the, impre the, the important thing is don't be afraid to ask questions of the student. And, and you need to, you may actually need to take a time out and say, guys, I may ask you questions. It doesn't mean that you've done it wrong. It's just that I'm trying to get more information, okay? Uh, or like, I literally didn't hear you. <laughs> um, and and this, this is, again, modeling that normal negotiation of meaning that's gonna happen if they're in the bus station or they're at the grocery store. And if they shut down and run away every time the clerk says, I'm sorry, what did you say? They're not going to get their food or they're not gonna buy their ticket. 
So they need to get used to that as a, as a thing that happens in communication. Um, and then you, you can do the prompting questions like, I don't understand, or what did you mean? And then if they're still looking at you as though they're panicked and don't know what you're talking about, then backtrack kind of like when you, when you are trying to push for a threshold on a communicative proficiency, backtrack to something they can do, offer them options. Did you mean this or did you mean that? And then they're in comfort zone again. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I have to pick one. I don't have to come up with it myself. And, and then it's a back and a forth going on. Um, another thing, again, I said it before, the creating sentence frames, but this time sentence frames for the room, big sentence frames, whether it's a word wall poster, whether it is a whole bunch of uh, sentence frames up, up high on the room, wall, um, but help, ways to help them respond to questions during feedback, okay? And it might be both the sentence frame and then an answer frame for it. So like, I didn't understand, and then a way to answer that. I meant this. Um, and you, of course, need to place them where they can easily access them. Sometimes you might think about having them have their own copy of it, but the drawback on that one is that not every student gets all of their resources out at one time. And so if they're just up on the wall for them to see, it's usually more useful to them. And you actually hit on something that came up in one of our other interviews, you know, this, this natural way of, of prompting for more information or for a clarification um, is essentially giving learners these conversational gambits and they aren't often taught necessarily in a, a, in a program, mm -hmm. but they are a common and normal and needed part of everyday conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think our listeners will really appreciate hearing this come up again because it, it is important and needs to come in throughout the teaching and learning process where our learners have many, many opportunities to internalize those regular gambits. Yeah, and, and it's also a, a transferable skill because uh, especially in states that are, are working with the co Common Core, this, this speaking and listening thing, the English teachers are stupefied as to how to do that. And they have to engage in that kind of uh, interaction and they normally aren't trained to do it. And so this is a transferable skill into English if we do it explicitly. And even if we share it with our English teachers, hey, here's a way to have them engage in communicative negotiation. Absolutely. Yeah, it's one of the points I like to share often, as you know, which is that sense of the, the role we can play as world language educators, supporting our students' success across the curriculum. And a very clear one is that how to provide students with ongoing regular speaking and listening opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you so much to, for taking the time to share your experience and expertise and strategies with us today, Christine. It was really an honor having you here. Thank you. Um, and this actually brings to a close the podcast series on the HLTPs, but we do have a lot more to come because each of our speakers is designing a TED-Ed lesson on their HLTP, and we also have two 90-minute webinars coming soon. And these, will, these webinars will examine how teachers can design even more powerful project-based language learning experiences through implementation of the six high-leverage teaching practices. In the meantime, I want to thank all of you for listening and learning with me via the incredible expertise of our guests over the course of this podcast. Bye-bye.